Naomi Smith was your average 15 year old schoolgirl. She loved her family, she loved animals, she had dreams to go on and have her own family one day. But on one fateful night, Naomi left the house to run an errand for her mother and she was never seen alive again. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be discussing the murder of Naomi Smith. But quickly, before we get into the case, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service with some of the best documentaries on the whole of the internet that I've ever found. They have documentaries in so many different genres, space, science, history, nature, and of course, true crime. I say this all the time, but the reason that Magellan TV is one of my favorite streaming services is because their true crime section is so unique and they cover a lot of smaller cases from all over the world that I'd never come across before and I don't think I would have had I not had Magellan TV. For example, one of the new releases that I watched recently took place in South Africa and actually I had heard of this case so maybe that's not a good example but there are a lot on there that I hadn't come across before I got Magellan TV but the new release that I watched it was called Murdered on Honeymoon. Annie Devani and her husband were newlyweds they had just gotten married and they were going to South Africa on their honeymoon but Annie would not return home. Her dead body was found in the back of a minivan taxi just parked on the side of the road somewhere in South Africa. And I'm not gonna tell you much more about the case. I'll let you go and watch the documentary yourself, but that was such a good telling of that case. Magellan TV is completely ad-free, so you're never gonna be interrupted while you're watching your documentaries. And they post between 15 and 20 hours of new content every single week. So you're never gonna run out of things to watch. And they are very, very kindly offering you guys a one month free trial when you click the link down below in the description of this video. Thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring. Now, before we get into the actual case, I do just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Just a couple of content warnings before we get into this. This one, this case is about the rape and murder of a child. So if that is something that you don't wanna hear about right now, I completely understand. Click out this video and hopefully I'll get to see you another time with a different video. But with all that being said, let's get into the case. Naomi Louise Smith was born on March 4th, 1980 to parents Brian and Catherine Smith. She was their fourth child, the youngest and the only girl. She had three older brothers. Both of Naomi's parents, Brian and Catherine, they were both taxi drivers. However, her mother later became a bus driver instead. The family was originally from Coventry. That was where Naomi was born. But a couple of years later, they ended up moving to a small town called Nuneaton, which is in the Midlands in Warwickshire. And that was where Naomi and her three brothers grew up. Well, especially Naomi, because she moved there when she was only like a year or two old. So to her, that was home. All in all, Naomi Smith was just a very normal girl. She was quite quiet and quite shy. She seemed to struggle with her confidence and self-esteem. Maybe she had a little bit of anxiety. So she wasn't like the loudest personality in the room, but she was such a sweet girl. She was very um, caring, very nurturing, quite maternal, even though she was only 15. She loved animals. She loved children. She just always wanted to be caring for something. And so actually her dream career was to maybe one day work with children or with animals. She either wanted to be a vet or like a childminder. Naomi was very dedicated to anything that she set her mind to. So whether that was her schoolwork, I think she got pretty good grades and she was a very talented gymnast. Naomi loved music. She was one of those teenage girls that was very into boy bands because in the like mid 1990s, that was boy band era. There was like Take That and Westlife and NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. She loved them all, all of them. And she liked Michael Jackson as well. She actually played an instrument herself or maybe a couple, I don't know. I couldn't find exactly what instruments she played, but I know that she did play in her church band. Oh yeah, her and her whole family were Christian. They would go to church. Yeah, I think her and a couple of her friends were in this church band. They all played different instruments. So at the time of this case, Naomi Smith was 15 years old and she was was still in high school. She was on track to be sitting her GCSE exams at the end of the following year. And she was on track to receive good grades as well. Like I said, she was a very hardworking, intelligent girl. 
However, Naomi would never get to sit those exams. On September 14th, 1995, Naomi was just chilling at home with her parents and around 9.30 p.m. that night, her mum comes over to her, hands her a letter and she says, would you mind going to post this in the post box? at the end of the road. It really wasn't far, it was only like two streets away. And so Naomi was like, yes, of course, mum, I will go and post this letter. And she left the house. Her parents expected her back literally within five minutes. It was two streets away. She would walk there and walk back. But 10 minutes later, she's still not home. So her parents wait a bit longer and about half an hour goes by. Naomi's still not home. And so they're thinking, well, maybe she bumped into one of her friends on the estate. She lived on an estate and like all the kids that lived there would all play together. They were all friends. So chances are she's walked to the post box, bumped into another kid and just stayed out for a bit, stayed chatting with them. Her parents didn't deep it too much. They, they didn't think there was anything wrong. But as the night's going on, Naomi's still not coming home. It's dropping dark outside and her parents are starting to get worried. And by the time 11 p.m. rolls round, her parents know that they need to do something because that was late for a 15 year old girl to be out, especially when they thought she would be back within five minutes. They were now worried about where she was. So her father, Brian, decides that he is gonna to go out and try and look for his daughter. So he jumps in his car and he is driving around the whole estate looking for her maybe playing out with her friends on the street, but there's no one out there. It's 11 p.m. It's dark, all the kids are in bed. He couldn't find Naomi on the estate at all. And so the next place Brian checks, he drives to the post box where she would have been posted in that letter but she's not there. After that, Brian decides to go and check Naomi's best friend, Emma's house, because Naomi had been playing out with Emma earlier on in the day. I think her and Emma were both in the church band. So they'd been together all day. Brian thought, well, maybe she'd gone back to Emma's house or something, maybe, who knows? So he drives to Emma's house. Emma's there, but Naomi isn't. And she says she hasn't seen or heard from Naomi since she left her earlier on in the day. And now that Emma knew that her best friend was missing, she was panicked as well. And so much so that she wanted to go out and look for Naomi with Brian. So Emma goes and jumps in the car and the two of them are now driving around the estate, still looking around the streets for Naomi. The next place that they went to go and check was a park that was on the estate, which was where the kids would hang out quite a bit. It was called Ansley Common, and it was it was just your average park. It had a swing, slide, you know, all the usual. It had like a big patch of grass outside it where the kids would play football and different ball games. So Brian and Emma drive into like a little car park bit that it had next to it, and immediately they see something laying under the slide in the park. Brian got out of his car and walked into the park to go and investigate. And the closer he got to the slide, the more his heart started to sink. It was clear that this was a person laying under the slide. And as he got closer, he realized it was his daughter. It was Naomi Smith and she was covered in blood. Her father then noticed a huge slash across Naomi's throat and he knew that she was already dead. There was no saving his daughter. Police were called, Naomi's body was recovered, she was pronounced dead at the scene and so her body was taken for an autopsy at the morgue. The autopsy revealed her cause of death to be this slash wound to the neck. It was very, very deep. It was all the way across her neck. There was no way she could have survived this injury. But the autopsy also found that Naomi Smith had been sexually assaulted and her genitals mutilated by her attacker. It seemed that her genitals had been mutilated with the same weapon, probably a knife, that had been used to slash her throat. And there was another really, really important piece of evidence that came from this autopsy, and that was that there was a bite mark on Naomi's left breast. And if you've watched enough true crime shows by now, you know just how important, just how valuable that piece of evidence could be, because that could confirm a killer. As the news spread throughout the community of this brutal, horrifying murder of a young girl, everyone was kind of too scared to leave their houses, knowing that this murderer was still at large. And it was clearly a very sadistic killer at that, because not only had they slashed her throat, but gone on to mutilate her genitals. 
And it's a child, this is a child. Police had to act quickly because they just didn't know this could be the start of a serial killer on their hands. And so they got to work on this investigation as quickly as they possibly could. Immediately around 30 police officers were sent to the area where Naomi's body was found, you know, the park and the estate and the surrounding areas. And they were just gonna search. They were just gonna look around for any evidence, but they really didn't find anything. They were hoping they could find like a ditched murder weapon or I, I don't know, something, anything, but there really wasn't, there was no evidence in the area. And it's annoying because it was also really heavily raining in the days after the murders. So it's not even like they could do any forensic investigations because the rain had washed away well, anything that they'd be able to find. There was no blood left or anything. So police were just gonna have to do some good old fashioned asking around. Like they were just gonna have to go knocking door to door, people in the area asking if they'd seen or heard anything. Within the first day or two of the investigation, police questioned over 50 different people, different witnesses or, you know, like her family and her friends. And this way they were able to piece together a timeline of events of Naomi Smith's day in the run up to the murder. Like I said earlier, she'd been out with her best friend Emma that day. I think they'd either been at church band practice or they'd had like a performance or something. I know that they were both together with the band. And after this, Emma's mum picked up both the girls and dropped off Naomi at home. And they knew that she got home safe because her mum literally parked outside the house and watched her go inside the door. And of course, we know that Naomi was home that night with her mum and dad. Her mum was the one that asked her to take the letter to the letterbox. That was around 9.30 p.m. And this was the last time that Naomi was seen by anyone, was when she left the house to go to that post box. So police decided to go to the post box, open it up and see if the letter was there. And sure enough, it was. So we know that Naomi made it all the way to the post box that night. So it seems that Naomi was probably attacked on her walk back home from the post box. And actually there was a girl that lived opposite the post box who said she'd seen Naomi posting the letter that night. She didn't see anything suspicious though. Literally, she just saw Naomi walk to the post box, post the letter, and then she turned back around and walked down an alleyway. But this alleyway led in the direction of Ainsley Common Park where Naomi's body was later found. Other than that one girl's account of seeing Naomi, no one else in the area had seen or heard anything suspicious at all. That was the only witness account that they had to go off. So instead, police decided to channel their efforts into doing public appeals. They were gonna put this case all over the news and ask if anyone had seen anything or heard anything and if they would come forward. And it actually worked. Police got a call from someone that kind of lived in the area saying that they'd seen a group of lads, like older lads, teenage lads, just hanging about, they looked a bit suspicious and they thought the police should know. Police deemed this lead to be quite a good one. I, I don't know, they decided to put a lot of their effort into finding these lads. And so they did another public appeal. They even offered a 10,000 pound reward for any information about this group of lads. And then about a week after the murder on September 21st, 1995, Police think they've got these lads. They think they've got their suspects. So they planned a series of coordinated raids where multiple different police officers were gonna go to all these different boys' houses all at once, all at the same time, and arrest them all and search their houses and like take any evidence that they needed. This was gonna be like a whole operation. Like this took a lot of planning and a lot of officers and all these lads were gonna be transported to different police stations in Warwickshire so that they couldn't communicate. Like a lot of thought was put into this plan. There was five of these boys, by the way. I think I didn't mention that. There's five different lads. They're all taken to different police stations. They're all arrested and they're all questioned for hours and hours and hours and hours. Now, police are only allowed to keep potential suspects in custody for a maximum of 72 hours. And at the end of that 72 hours, they need to make a decision. Can we charge them with something or do we have to let them go? They have to do one of those two things after three days. And that time was quickly running out with these five lads. Police were questioning them, questioning them, but they just couldn't get any evidence against them. Like these boys weren't incriminating themselves. They weren't, like there was nothing. And so when these 72 hours came to an end, police were like, we're gonna have to let them go because they didn't have enough evidence against these boys to be able to charge them. They can't charge them without evidence. So the only thing left is to 
let them back out. And honestly, at this point, after questioning these lads so much, police didn't actually think that they were guilty anymore. Like, genuinely, they can't get any evidence, so why would they think these boys were guilty of anything? Turns out, all five of these lads were actually innocent. They had nothing to do with Naomi Smith's murder, and so the investigation continued. But now police were feeling quite defeated. I mean, they'd put a lot of time and effort and energy into that one lead. They'd offered a 10,000 pound reward for goodness sake. They were so sure that those five lads were responsible. But now they were back to square one and they didn't really know what to do. Luckily, it wouldn't be long until they got another lead that they were able to focus on because the results of the autopsy were coming back now. This was a few days in. Well, actually the forensic testing part of the autopsy. So they already had the basic autopsy that we talked about earlier, but they'd now forensically tested Naomi Smith's body and they had found a DNA profile on that bite mark on her breast, a saliva DNA profile. So this, this is her killer's DNA. However, it was a DNA profile, which is a lot less like specific than just like a DNA sample is. But they knew that this DNA was gonna be super, super useful in the investigation because if they had say three suspects, they could test all three suspects DNA against the DNA profile and they would more than likely find one of them that had a higher percentage match to this profile. Does that make sense? Hope it does. Police were quite gassed that they'd found this evidence because this meant that they could start ruling people out. If not finding the killer, they could at least rule out enough people to narrow down their pool. So they started compiling a list of a bunch of people of interest. And these were like people that had previous violent criminal history, men that had been violent to women in the past, paedophiles, you know, anyone that seems like they could do something like this, you know? This list was like prioritized. So it was the more violent criminals that would be tested first. And then it went into just like other, other people of interest. I don't know, men, men around that age that live in the area. And there was like hundreds of men on this list. This was gonna be one hell of a job. But police were actually quite lucky because one of the first batches that they sent off for lab testing they received a match. It was to a 19 year old man named Edwin Hopkins who lived on the same estate as Naomi Smith. He lived with his parents. He had a normal job. I think he was a decorator and he was just a normal guy by all accounts, apart from one thing. Police very quickly learned that Edwin Hopkins was an avid collector of knives. And this wasn't just like an innocent, harmless collection. Like this was an obsession with knives. It went way deeper than just a collection for Edwin because he'd had this obsession for years, literally since he was a child. His father actually introduced him to, to knives because uh, his dad used to take him hunting when he was younger and they used to kill and like skin animals like rabbits together as like a father son bonding thing. I don't know. So this obsession had stemmed from since he was a child, he'd been killing animals. And when Edwin got a bit older, he started just carrying these knives with him everywhere he went. Like even to school some days, he would just, he would always have a knife on him. Police then looked into Edwin's criminal history and they found that this actually wasn't the first attack that he'd been accused of. He had been accused of a very similar attack. A woman had reported to police that Edwin had attacked her in the exact same park, Ansley Common, as where Naomi Smith's body was later found. This woman told police that she'd literally just been walking through that park that night when Edwin approached her and started talking to her and, and she talked back. He didn't seem weird or intimidating to her at first. She felt quite comfortable just, just talking to a stranger in the park and he even offered her a cigarette. She took it, the two of them smoked, they chatted for a little while and then this woman turns around and goes to leave. She's walking for a little while and then she hears footsteps behind her. She turns and she noticed that Edwin has started following her. So she keeps walking, she speeds up a little bit, but then the next thing she knows, Edwin jumps on her from behind and pins her down in this field. Edwin Hopkins tried to rape this woman, but she somehow managed to fight him off. I think she kneed him in the crotch and she managed to get him off her and she ran to safety and she managed to report this to the police. But there was one part of this attack that really, really stood out to police. Before this woman managed to fight him off and run away, Edwin Hopkins had bitten her on the breast, just like Naomi Smith. Frustratingly, absolutely nothing came out of the victim reporting this incident to the police. I don't know why, that makes me so angry, 
but Edwin was never arrested. He was never charged with anything. So now the police had this damning evidence against Edwin Hopkins, they started treating him like their prime suspect. And as part of this, they wanted to question all his friends and family, first and foremost, to get a better idea of who Edwin Hopkins really was, but also a better idea of what he was doing on the night of the murder. And as it turns out, someone had been covering for Edwin Hopkins, someone in his own family, his own sister had lied for him this whole time. Now that there was such damning evidence as DNA, saliva DNA, his sister just broke down to police and admitted that she had lied in the beginning to protect her brother, but now she was ready to tell the truth. So Edwin's own alibi, this is what he told police he was doing on the night of the murder. He said that he was just chilling at home with his sister, they were playing Trivial Pursuit, and then at some point he offered to go to the shop and go and buy them some snacks and some beers. And so he did. This was about 9.30 p.m. He said that he was gone for about 15 minutes and then he was back home for 9.45 and the two of them continued playing the game all night. They were just home all night after that. So when police first heard this alibi from Edwin Hopkins, they had gone to his sister and said, is this correct? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. He was gone for 15 minutes, came back, we played the game all night. Turns out she'd lied. He was not gone for 15 minutes. He was gone for nearly an hour. And she didn't know what he was doing the whole time. And then when he returned an hour later, he was wearing different clothes. He was wearing a whole different outfit. He'd gotten changed. And so the sister questioned it at the time and she was like, why, why are you wearing different clothes? And he said that he tried to buy some milk from the shop and then on his way home, he had spilt it down himself. Like he'd like dropped it and it splattered everywhere, gone all over him. And luckily he had a spare change of clothes in his bag. So he'd just like gotten changed really quick. At the time when he came back home and he told this like weird little suspicious story, his sister didn't think too much of it because she doesn't know there's a little girl dead in the park, does she? She just thinks her brother's acting a bit weird. And so she's like, you know, whatever. The less I know, the better. And so that was why she'd initially lied to police because I don't know, I think it was just like sibling reflex, like a protective reflex. Her brother was in danger or like she deemed him to be in danger with these police. And so she just protected him. And as time was going on and as more and more evidence was coming out, she was thinking about it more and more. And she was thinking, wait, what if my brother has actually done something horrible and I have covered for him this whole time just because I blindly believe him. And it was at this point where she thought, I can't keep this to myself anymore. This seems far too suspicious. And that was when she went to the police with this. So the evidence is very, very quickly mounting up against Edwin Hopkins. But before they moved in and arrested him, police wanted to confirm one more thing. They grabbed Edwin's dental records and compared them to the bite mark on Naomi's chest and what do you know? It was an exact match. And it was a very obvious match as well because Edwin Hopkins had quite unique teeth. When he was younger, he'd lost one of his adult teeth, like one of his front adult teeth. And over the years, his existing teeth had like moved to fill the gap. But like in quite a weird way, he had very unique teeth. Ain't no one else got gnashes like him. So as soon as they saw this bite mark and how unique it was, and then they saw Edwin's teeth, they were like, of course, of course. So finally, 19 year old Edwin Hopkins was arrested and charged with the murder of Naomi Smith. He was taken to the police station. He was confronted with all of the evidence that police had collected against him. Damning evidence. And Edwin didn't even try and defend himself. He, he didn't try and lie. He just no commented all, all the way through the interviews. He just, he didn't admit to anything. He didn't say anything. He was very emotionless, just no comment. No comment. But that didn't matter because he was already charged and this case was due to go to trial. And on the very first day of his rape and murder trial, Edwin Hopkins stands up there and pleads not guilty. Despite having literal DNA evidence against him, he says he's not guilty. So the trial goes ahead. The whole way through the trial, Edwin was sticking with his alibi that he'd literally just nipped to the shop and nipped right back. He said he'd even gone past the post box on his way to the shop because they were like right next to each other. And he said he never saw anyone. He never saw Naomi, he never saw anyone. And it's so, so frustrating that Edwin is still sticking to this fake story even now because there's only two people that know what happened that night, Naomi Smith, and Edwin Hopkins. Naomi is not no longer here to tell the story and Edwin refuses. For that reason, we're never gonna know the exact facts. We're never gonna know exactly what happened to Naomi unless Edwin 
grows some balls and confesses, we're not gonna know. We don't know how the two of them met on that night, how they crossed paths. I mean, I believe they already knew each other because they were only four years apart and they grew up on the same estate. I have no doubt that they probably played out together quite a bit. They were probably friends, which makes this all the more horrifying if they did know each other, if they had been friends, and he turned around and did this to her? Because it makes me wonder how they ended up in the park. Like, did he attack her there at the park? How did she get to the park? What if things started off fine when the two of them first crossed paths? What if they were just having a normal conversation and they went to the park together consensually and then this attack took place? We don't know because Edwin won't say. The next thing we know is that Edwin turns up back home an hour later in different clothes, which again really sticks out to me because why did he just have a spare whole set of clothes in his bag, along with a knife as well. Does that mean that he was leaving the house that day planning to murder someone? I don't know about you guys, but I am not just carrying around a knife and a spare change of clothes at all times. I'm not. At the end of the murder trial in January of 1997, Edwin Hopkins was found guilty of the rape and murder of 15 year old Naomi Smith. For this, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years, which means the soonest he would have been able to get out was when he was 39 years old. And that would have been in 2015, but it didn't happen. But don't get too excited because he was actually released from his prison in 2021 and put into an open prison. So he's still in the prison system, but being in an open prison pretty much means he's free to kick about in society during the day, which is scary to me. Really, really scary actually. Mainly because of the way that this man handled himself throughout this case. Just no comment, no comment, no comment. He's never shown any remorse. He's never even admitted to it when we've got DNA evidence, DNA evidence. I don't know. I just don't like the sound of this man being back out in society with that obsession with knives and a history of killing animals. I don't know. It scares me, it really scares me. But that is all I have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below. That would really, really help me out. And thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Remember, they are giving you guys a one month free trial when you click the link down below in the description of this video. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Oh, if you want to watch another one of my videos, there you go. If you want to subscribe to me, there you go. Uh, yeah, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.